understanding what are some of the penalties under the law is important because then it's important to now know um, how one can ensure that you are in compliance with it. And there was a point you made, and I want to go to that first of all, while we wait to see if there are um, questions or comments from the floor, okay? But you made the point that um, if the procurement officer were to comply with directives coming down, that by itself does not absolve them of responsibility. Um, now, this is something that is going to be very difficult for procurement officers because the practice and culture um, has been that you get directives from above. So it's, it's going to be a challenging area for them to now uh, be able to say no. So how, how can the Office of the Regulator um, assist in that? We do have, let me give an example first that happened about a year and a half ago. One of the state enterprises, chairman and board, called me on a conference call one day. And they said, Munilal, here's a situation. We are in an active tender um, taking place right now. And uh, we have gone through the process under the new act. And we are about to award the contract. And just per chance that there may be some concern we escalated. I won't tell you how high up it was escalated, but it was escalated and they were told, and um, we have in this discussion, the chairman said, they were told, you cannot award the contract to that particular contractor because he did not support the party in power. I'm being as, as plain as possible. And I said, well, what you have to do is to get that person to put it in writing and instruct you. Of course, it did not come in writing. They went ahead and awarded the contract and the board and management is still in place. This is about standing up for what is right. And if you stand up for what is right and the more people we have in this country standing up in defense of proper procurement procedures and not being a renegade, we will have persons doing the right things. Yes, some persons may end up losing their jobs, but there is a recourse in terms of victimization and investigations that could lead to consequences for the persons who took those actions in terms of victimization. So that is also protected. We do have our whistleblowing facility will be live from within an, a month or so. We have just about signed the contract. Tomorrow is the signing of the contract for the whistleblowing facility. It is a foreign company. Unfortunately, we, we, we could not have gone with the chance uh, for people to say that local companies, they, it will be um, a disaster, et cetera, and compromise the whole integrity of the process. So that is in place now, and we will be rolling out that very shortly. So there is protection under the act. We have wide rating investigation. And if we so desire under the act, and we do not want to use our staff to investigate, we can bring in forensic accountants and so on to do investigation on our behalf. That is provided for in the act also. Okay, but we do want to look at the fact that um, we don't want um, procurement officers to lose their jobs and to buckle under the pressure. Therefore, uh, this is just a question. You know, is there some uh, procedure which would allow for data to document what might have been um, directives, which is what Robbie explained that he would have done in Guyana, because at the moment they don't have this regulation that we are about to um, have, uh, we hope, you know. Um, that has to form, form part of the whole procurement file. You must put it in writing. And once you decide, Robbie is right, once you decide that you're going to put it in writing, people will start to back down. I can let you know that even though the act is not fully proclaimed, we have received 16 whistleblowing already that we have escalated and we have gotten resolution on at least three of those already. And I'm sure nobody knows that it is in the public domain, but persons have come forward and they have spoken. And I can tell you some of the accounting officers who we would have engaged in those discussions have taken the right decision and taken the right action to deal with it. I can't say much more than that, but I'm telling you that we have the support of a lot of the 
the accounting officers. Okay. So I have uh, another question I want to ask of you. I see that there are persons who now have um, some comments on the chat, but I'll, I'll, I'll take the floor and ask my question. <laughs> um, uh, which is to say, if there are procurement officers who are in the session now, who would like their organizations to come in compliance with the act, even before it is seen? Um, what are some of those steps that, that they can do? And, and is that something that you would encourage? Or would you um, tell them, wait until the act has been proclaimed and then ensure your processes are streamlined? Good procurement is good procurement. And we don't need necessarily to wait until the act is fully proclaimed. I can tell you straight off, Heritage has adopted the act. Flip their co. And I'm calling these names because these persons will know that, that they are in compliance, T and Tech. Mm -hmm. Every day when you open the newspapers, you will see a host of persons now um, inviting tenders. Previously, you never used to see so much. A number of organizations recently, four of the ministries under the, this pandemic and so on, would have been in a little difficult position in terms of these manual and paper-based approach to procurement activities and they wanted a solution. And they came to us and we developed a solution for invited bids electronically and opening it electronically and so on, even without an electronic procurement system. So a number of organizations have already fallen in place. I can tell you this morning, I didn't attend the session because we had a meeting with the office of the president. The office of the president right now, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind tell, telling this, that they are presently, without the act being proclaimed, looking at developing their first annual procurement plan. And that is so commendable that the head of, the, head of state yeah. is pushing that. So a number of agencies are in the process of full proclamation. You do not have to wait full operationalization you do not have to wait because good procurement is good procurement and all our handbooks and guidelines is already on site we have 32 of them on site you can take those now some of the things in terms of how you get the approvals and so on right now with your present boards and the financial delegations with whole until we switch over to the new act so i, I hope that helps Yes, it does. Um, and we also have um, a comment from someone. I'm hoping that you would be willing to share your slides, which you had showed earlier with us, and we could send it to the participants, because there was someone who is saying that they are currently reviewing their procurement policy, and they wanted to go back to one of the slides, which would have provided some guidance on what they should consider in their review. Absolutely. Um, we will share it, for sure. Okay, so we have um, another comment here. So that first one was by Giselle Dinsey from um, Nihus. We have um, Alec Babwa who is saying, if persons are stepping up, it means that the act definitely has merit, even though it's not yet proclaimed. And then we have Sumati Pasad, and I think hers is a question. She says, how does the penalties apply if the procurement officers are not involved in the tender process, meaning the procurement process is started and initiated at the end user stage and procurement only gets involved after the fact. And when the procurement is created and approved, so oh, that might be a procurement report. I'm not sure what PRD stands for, but the procurement officer, she says at this point, only do review for due diligence and approve the PO to go out. Yeah, I think what they mentioned in there is the PR, the purchase request. Right, yes. Right, so most of the times you will have the user department with the budget, they are the budget holders, so they ultimately have to sign off on the PR, the purchase request. That then comes into the procurement department, and the procurement department is the one who says, we will go ahead and in, um, invite in persons to tender whether or not it's three quotes and so on. They, the procurement department is the one that deals with that, not the user department. The user department is the one with the authority to say we will spend, and this is what we're looking for. 
They may also even suggest some of these suppliers that they would have dealt with in the past. All that is, is okay, but the procurement officer and the procurement department is the one ultimately responsible for that procurement activity. And they cannot be absolved from that. So, so Mati, does that answer your, your question and your concern? Does that mean the penalties do still apply to the procurement officers? Okay, so... Uh, if, I, if I should say, for me as a procurement specialist, I would not even be a part of that process. That someone, like for example, on this same COVID project, the, some department brings me quotation in, a, in, in, in an effort to expedite. But I would say, that's okay, I will accept yours, but I will, I will go and get mine as well. Absolutely. Right? And, and in, in, in all cases, there seems to have gone to some bottom house business and, and printing shops and so forth. When I go out to the, to the uh, big printeries and, and businesses with the, who have the capacity of doing business, the price were far way cheaper. So I, I would advise any procurement officer, if someone brings you a document to process like quotation or whatever, you are not comfortable with it, just don't proceed. It's simple as that. Because from the time you take part in, part in, in the processing of it, you, will be, you are a custodian of it and you will be held responsible. I fully endorse that you should never be a rubber stamp. Yeah, correct. That's not your responsibility. Okay, so we have this um, comment by Dorian Dyer, which says, totally agree with firm disciplinary mechanisms for infractions by procurement practitioners but without an overhaul of ineffective and inefficient regulations, this can also work against officers exercising practical discretion, even within what is allowed. So that is, they might be afraid to do so. So it's a catch-22. Well, the, the, the regulations are before the legislative, the LRC right now as we speak. We had a meeting with the uh, Attorney General and his team about two and a half weeks ago. So it is in the final um, state of preparation. So for those who were a little bit apprehensive um, in the sessions and saying, well, it's taking too long. Yeah, I agree. I'm not disagreeing at all. I'm just as frustrated as many persons, but we just about, and the prime minister would have said that is coming immediately after the budget. The committee that he set up in terms of the recovery committee on page 50 of their report, stated that the procurement legislation should be given full proclamation as a matter of priority. So we almost said the regulations are coming, guys. We have prepared it and um, that will guide a lot of the practices and so on that is not specifically spelled out in the act. And to support the regulations and the act, we have all 32 of the handbooks and guidelines that give details as to how you do it. And we have held a number of training sessions already with public officers. The next training session, and take note of it, public officers on the 5th of September, of November, sorry, 5th of November, we have a session coming up on procurement plan, how you develop your procurement plan for issue into the public. That is on the 5th of November. We have already have 137 persons sign up from the public. So please, sorry, 137 in the morning session and 45 in the evening session. So almost 200. So make sure you get a space. Okay, so that is November 5th, which is next week, huh? That's right. Right. Now, persons who want to um, be able to register, what do they do? Well, you need to send your information to the office because we are only inviting the named procurement officers whose name that we have and all accounting officers. So we have already sent out all those invitations. But if you want to join, you are not a named procurement officer, no an accounting officer will be happy to let you join in with us. So just call the office, 6274OPR. 226-4OPR. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, so basically then, um, your office has already been working with a number of organizations 
to bring in their procedures and practices into line with what the legislation would require. Um, may I ask what has been um, any of the key challenges that you have faced in that process? And then I'll come back to a question that's on the chat. Yeah, one of the key challenges that we will be facing, um, and we have already identified it, a lot of the ministries who before would have depended on the Central Tenders Board to do their major procurement activities. With the full proclamation of the act within three months that Central Tenders Board goes away. Central Tenders Board is no longer going to be functional. And therefore, the procurement officers who are now taking on that responsibilities within the line ministries will have to upskill very quickly. And we are trying to do that as quickly as possible because the concern we have is that persons will be placed in those positions who are not adequately trained or competent to do the job. Robbie, Robbie hit on a good point where you can't just take junior officers and put them into a role and say, be a procurement officer. This is not child's play. And you have to put them in the position and pay them adequately. You cannot just put them and expect a, um, a junior clerk. What we found out in terms of the regional corporations, we had clerical workers temporary clerical workers fulfilling the role of procurement officers for multi-million dollars contracts. So no wonder you get what you pay for. So that is something we have to fix. That is our major concern, the capacity of the public officers to deal with complex procurement activities. Uh, if, if I should say, say it well, um, Management or uh, accounting officer, government uh, government uh, ministers, they have to accept that procurement is no longer a back office in finance. It's one of the things that I've advocated for that procurement should be delinked completely from finance because the person who signs payment should not be the ultimate responsible for procurement because they will try to influence the process they will refuse to sign off payments. They will not be an independence of the procurement officer and that department. So like, um, like you said, they, you, procure, you have to have procurement professionals, not just some anybody you throw. Because gone are the days, I knew this, gone are the days procurement stores supply chain where you're, you throw your delinquent staff in those departments. And I honestly could speak from experience. Maybe that's how I end up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, it, it, that's one thing we must recognize. Supply chain procurement, this entire thing is no longer a buck. It's the heart of any institution. It's where all our monies are spent and, and it, it, it needs to be strengthened as utmost as possible. Just to give you an idea, just to add to what Robbie is saying. Another study was done by the OECD that suggested that between 10 and 30% of money spent on public procurement could be saved if you have the proper systems in place. If we just superimpose that on our budget, we have a budget of about $50 billion a year. 26 billion is spent on, let's say, procurement. 20%, let's say the midpoint, 20% of that gives you just about 5.2 billion. You can save $5.2 billion a year. That could well go towards paying for the professionals that you need to do the right job. And they will save you that money and pay their salaries a hundredfold. So that's the logic behind it. This is what we're looking at. Very good. So I thank my friends who are studying SIPs and who are finding that the, the studies are extremely hard will take heart now because it does mean that you have to bring in a great amount of competence to the position. Um, and we do have a comment from Natasha Davis on the chat. Natasha says the salary scale for procurement officers need to be revised in my country as a means of protecting the officer from pressure. When you have a procurement officer working for minimum wage, same as the cleaners and, and, and contractors are offering them 20 times their salary for a minor bit of information, it sets the stage for corruption. Um, Natasha, what, which country are you? Um, 
she's from Guyana. The, the, Natasha was the one that I. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Natasha, Natasha, you're quite right. Um, just, just to add, um, Kamala, what we have done, and we are about to issue the competency level under the Act. We are supposed to set the um, training standards, competency levels, and certification requirements for all persons involved in procurement. We have just completed that exercise, and we are about to publish it on our website, and it will be published to all public bodies. These are the different positions. These are the competency levels, the certification requirements, and we have been working with the accreditation council to get these programs accredited. It includes SIPs and so on. In fact, we had a session with SIPs, um, when was it yesterday? Or? Tuesday, we had a, a full session with SIPs to bring them into the picture, the SIPs persons in training. Yes, um, I'm aware of that. Some of um, my classmates mentioned that they were present for that session as well. So, so that was excellent. Um, Natasha is sharing that in fact, some of their officers um, in Guyana are in fact SIPs trained and not being paid um, sufficiently. So perhaps that's something that the office can also um, work towards ensuring that government ministries are adequately compensating their procurement officers who are coming with the level qualification that you deem necessary. Um, for those positions, because um, it's important that whatever processes we need to put in place to get the right people in the right positions be supported. I, I think you, you're quite right. We did have a meeting with the CPO and the ministry and went through that particular process and they showed us all the salary scales of all the officers from manager, supervisor, buyer and so on. And they do, they, they already have that. The problem is getting persons and recruiting persons in those positions. And that's where we are having some um, issues because some of the ministries have been guided to get the person some internal resources. And that's one of the difficulties that we will be facing. Okay, so what that means too is that their internal staff themselves need to ensure that they go out and get the qualifications. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that because we're not looking to replace people um, in their jobs, but certainly to, to help. Now, apart from SIPs, which we are aware of, and SIPs is offered, I think there are two schools, certainly CTS College and Chaguanas offers the SIPs program. What other qualifications should procurement officers be looking at? We, we, we are recommending things like technicians, diploma, um, first degree, masters and so on, all those are programs and some of the institutions in Trinidad, like, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to call the names because um, a lot of them has already come to us and said, well, if we put on this program, would it satisfy the need? So that's why we had to produce this certification requirements and what is required at the different levels. So now they can develop their curriculum to satisfy the needs. Um, no, nothing against you guys, Robbie, but we are hoping that one day we'll have all the CARICOM adopt these training standards so that we'll make sure that we speak from the same, um, uh, the, the, the thing about it as we're looking at CARICOM um, model build and so on to pull together um, procurement across the CARICOM region. So sooner or later, we'll have to have some means of assessing the capabilities and we want to be at the leading edge of that. But so, but in the interim, of course, there are um, the programs which are acceptable. So there are degree programs where there is a specialization in supply chain management or masters, MBAs even that specializes in supply chain management and just six, yeah. That's right. Um, and of course, the the SIPs program, which I am currently pursuing, so I can tell you, it's quite rigorous and it's excellent. I wanted to do it because I wanted to understand what these issues are as this legislation comes into being. And I have found it to be a tremendous area of learning. Um, so we have another question on the, the chat now. It's from Cheryl Ann Steele. She says, I heard Mr. Rambaran say that the procurement person should be separate from finance. However, I have been told that there is no need for a procurement officer but rather an officer performing the procurement function. Hmm. As such, the function has been performed by the finance lead. Well, our recommendation, and is a strong recommendation from the office, 
the procurement officer should be reporting directly to the accounting officer. There should not any, be anybody in between because that leads to problems because they could influence the outcome of decisions and so on, too many steps. So our recommendation is a direct line and we support Ravi on this one. You should not be involved in finance and paying the bills and also procuring. That leads to collusion. So um, our, our position is very strong. You report directly to the accounting officer and it should not be part of the finance function because that's a break, breakdown in internal controls. Who will guard the guard? Okay, um, forgive me, there was a lot of noise on my background, so I had to take off <laughs> my, my volume, but thank you. And I think there was um, a follow-up from Camille, which says, are our procurement departments adequately designed to prevent corruption in procurement? Is there a recommended design which includes adequate monitoring that supports separation of duties? Yes, we do have an um, uh, internal control matrix, a RACI matrix in terms of how you go about appointing positions and persons who is accountable, responsible, need to discuss things with consult and so on in the matrix. And that is that forms part of our handbook and guidelines. So it's there. Um, what we can do is to get the relevant section because I wouldn't want you to go through 32 books just to look for that. But I'll send the link. We'll send the link to you, Kamla, and you can disseminate it among the participants. But there is a racy matrix that is developed for the whole internal control and separation of duties and so on. All right. Um, it is 6.12, so we'll be wrapping up in a little bit. We have Afra with us, um, who had presented just before. Afra, before you take your leave, is there anything that you would want to add following the presentation here from Robbie and um, Munilal and some of the concerns that has been raised by the participants? Yeah, you're still on mute. Yes, Kamla, I'm sorry. The presentation that we made were very good. And uh, we do have a lot of work to do to close this off. I was very encouraged, Munila, to hear that you, you're, still in, in, you're still engaged in a process of, of, of dotting I's and crossing the T's with, with, with the AG. You mentioned meeting the AG two and a half weeks ago and so on. And uh, that has given me pause because I was about to go into a full campaigning mode but I guess I will have to call you and we'll talk soon. And Robbie, yeah, good to hear you again, you know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> huh? What's that? We'll talk. Give me, a, give me a call. I will call you, yeah, for sure. Let, for let sure. me also say, while yeah, I have yeah, yeah. Afra here, he will be happy Come to on. know. We have now fully implemented it, our online database for registration of contractors. Good. So there will be only one database for all registered contractors. So you yes. choose only from that and we have so far, in the short space of time that we have rolled it out to the public, we have over 600 persons attended the session and 136 persons already registered on the system. Yes, very good. So, so we are making strides there and that is live and alive and it was developed by a local company. Good, nice. Thanks very good. much, Munida. Okay. Okay, colleagues, have a good evening. Thank you. It's okay, right. after all the best. Thank you, bye-bye. Yes. Thank you. Now, um, so for um, those procurement officers who are hearing about the database that's been developed, so if they are aware of suppliers who generally would provide goods and services to their government ministries, what would they need to advise them to do? They, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm afraid to tell you this, Kamala, but a number of them as persons have come to the ministry and said, could you pre-qualify us? And they said, well, no, you have to go to the OPR. So you, you point them in our direction and it's, it's, it's easy. It's an online, um, fully online. You upload all your documentation online. Everything is done online. And through our workflow process, once you fill in all the, the information and it's complete, through our workflow process, it goes to the public body. And the public body now has the could view it and once everything is okay, they press a button and you are pre-qualified. It is as simple as that. So point them in our direction, oprtt.org, or let them call the number and we can guide them as to how they go ahead getting um, pre-qualified. Um, we would have issued a, 
uh, advertisement a couple months ago, inviting people to come to these sessions because it's a two, two step session, one where we look at the whole issue of the integrity and code of conduct. So we train them in the code of conduct and also in how you use the database and uh, how you fill out all the information. And they can, as soon as they finish the session, you get on the database and log in and you can go in and register. We have that on recording so that you don't have to come to a live session. You just download the recording and it takes you step by step how you, you go through and get registered. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being patient. Um, I guess we all keep learning here. Um, you, you, gotta, you gotta do the right thing. Um, it, it's sometimes it's easier said than done. Um, but I can tell you in the entire process of procurement, once you are involved, the undue pressure from someone else will only compromise you because at the end of the day, they will pull themselves out completely and said, you are the one who is ultimately responsible. Sometimes it's hard to change the culture in, in, the, in the organization. Like someone earlier said, um, there was a, a, a question or a statement about who carries out the function of, of procurement. That is a recipe for disaster. I hope you could go back to your, your, uh, your agency and advocate for some changes. And I'm, I, I like, I myself is looking forward for more of these sessions where we can learn. Um, we recently had a change of government. There are some um, new dynamics here. Um, I think I will re reach out to some of my counterparts for some um, of their experience as well, but looking forward to be here again and stay safe everyone. Very much Robbie. And um, as I ask you to close Munila, there's a question from Beverly Swan, um, which you can address as you end. And she asks, Yes, yeah, right. So, is it that its own supplier databases are now negated? The answer is yes. Under the Act, the office is responsible for the development and maintenance of a database of pre qualified contractors. Here and after, once the Act is fully proclaimed, you can only access persons to do business with in the database. Gone are the days where people had to pay under the table to get registered with supply with them. Um, public bodies and so on. We, the office is now responsible for maintaining that database. So you will, on all your contractors and suppliers, you have to encourage to get registered. If they're not registered, you will be hard pressed to convince us that you are um, going and doing business with them without coming through the proper channel of the database. And that will be in breach of the act. So let me close as I always do. What we are doing, this is not about Munilal, it's not about Kamala, it's not about Afra, it's not about Robbie. This is about what legacy we are leaving for our children and our grandchildren in this country. For years, we have battled with allegation of corruption, wastage, and the amount of money that would have passed through this country. Think about what we could have been today in terms of hospital, roads, infrastructure, and so on. We have an opportunity, guys, to stand firm and to push to make sure this happens and happens very quickly. Let's leave a legacy for our children, grandchildren, and the generations to come to say that our parents did something to benefit this country. We have waited too long. Let's move forward and get it done. Thank you very much.